Welcome to the Master Circle Podcast. I'm Dr. Bob Hoffman, and each week we'll be bringing you the freshest, most cutting-edge information in chiropractic, wellness, personal growth, and success. All the systems, strategies, and philosophies you need to grow your practice and life can be found in these podcasts. Follow the links below to learn more about the Master Circle and everything we have to offer you. Please enjoy this podcast edition, and let's keep growing together. So now we're going to talk about chiropractic and spinal research and practice building and childhood vaccinations. What is the best way to research chiropractic? When the federal government went after me, they said chiropractic isn't proven for large-scale randomized clinically controlled trials. And therefore, it's unproven except for low back pain. Well, we think there's some research for low back. Otherwise, you're not proven for anything else. What would you say to them? I didn't know either. So I started researching it, and I started speaking to lawyers and government officials and scientists and going to conferences, and I realized something very important. Large-scale randomized controlled clinical trials are developed for only pharmaceuticals. They test drugs. That's not for chiropractic. It's not for clinical ways of looking at things. Even the Office of Alternative Medicine wrote and said, oh, no, large-scale randomized controlled clinical trials is not the best way to research an alternative healthcare profession. The whole basis of their argument was undercut completely. But what is the best way to research chiropractic? Outcome studies. You know what outcome studies are? They are so cool. You take 50 people or 100 or 1,000 and you do something to them. It's called an intervention. It could be giving them a drug. It could be giving them vitamin C. It could be having them drink more water or exercising or adjusting them. But you do it to them, and then you look and see how they are. Universally, their health, physical, mental, every aspect, emotional. And since we help reconnect people, and we're not treating back aches or neck aches or headaches, but we're adjusting spines so the whole body works better and the mind works better, we should be able to see a total person change as a result of our adjustments. Outcome studies are the best way to do that. And we do have some outcome studies in our profession. We have quite a few. One outcome study was done with nearly 3,000 patients. This is what they found. Patients report significant positive changes in physical health, mental, emotional state, stress, meaning lower stress in their lives, and life enjoyment under chiropractic care. Outcome studies show chiropractic helps the whole person. Backache, neck ache, headache, oh yeah, of course, that's under physical. Less stress, they enjoy life more. Another one done two years later, chiropractic is associated with significant benefits in physical and mental emotional state and combined wellness. Another one, this is done on people 65 years and older with maintenance care. Reduced nervousness with maintenance care. Possible reduced depression. There was a 50% reduction in medical visits. The need for hospitalization was one-third of people of the same age. Maintenance care appeared to replace rather than be complementary to medical treatment. We're not complementary. We're alternative. We're not going to compliment them. They don't deserve any compliments, I don't think. <laughs> right. We're alternative. Can you imagine people over 65 had two-thirds less hospitalization under chiropractic care, had half the medical visits? How many of us have patients that don't bring their parents in? And medicine takes advantage of the two most fragile, defenseless groups in our population, the very young and the very old. They're the most drugged and the most taken advantage and the most hurt. Here's another one. For this one, you had to be 75 years or older to be in this study. This is what they found. Chiropractic users were less likely to be hospitalized, less likely to use a nursing home, and less likely to use prescription drugs, more likely to have better health, to exercise, and to be mobile. British Medical Journal did a follow-up on the Mead study. Benefits of chiropractic included pain reduction, but also improvements in sitting, sleeping, lifting, walking, standing, sex life, social life, and ability to travel. Imagine putting up a billboard in your town, chiropractic improves sex life, and cite the British Medical Journal. 
This is it. And you won't drop dead after you take it, like Viagra. The Windsor autopsies. This is our new brochure that's coming out. This is so cool. This happened. Dr. Henry Windsor is an MD who was inspired by osteopathic and chiropractic writings. And he said, how could doing something to the spine affect the kidneys, for example? So he wanted to see, is there a relationship between diseased internal organs and minor curvatures of the spine? He didn't buy into subluxations, but he likes the term minor curvatures. So he did autopsies on 50 or so patients, and a lot of cats too, by the way. And he looked for internal organs that were diseased. And then he went to the spine and wanted to see if there was a minor curvature in the spine. And this is what he found. Heart disease, all 20 cases had T1 to T5 out. Stomach disease, all nine cases, T5 to T9. Lung disease, all 26 cases had minor curvatures in the upper thoracic. Kidney, all 17 cases, T10 to T12. Prostate and bladder disease, all eight cases, L1 to L3. Uterine conditions, both cases, L2 was out, etc. And this was published in the Medical Times as early as 1921, has never been refuted. This is specific upper cervical adjustments on the CD4 counts of HIV positive patients. So what happened? Two groups of patients under medical care dying of AIDS, divided into half. One group in addition is given chiropractic care. Now you know that when you have AIDS, your white blood cells are very low, they're tanked out. So after six months, the group under medical care had a 9% drop in their already low white blood cells with two deaths. The chiropractic group, 49% increase in white blood cells, no deaths. This is the kind of information you need to give to priests, ministers, rabbis that counsel HIV patients, health officials. They need to know this. I took the government on to make this information available. Let's use it before they come back at us again. <laughs> Thank you. Did anybody here ever get a patient pregnant? Legally. Legal. Hey, all right. So this woman goes to the chiropractor, and he checks her, and she's got shoulder problems. And he says, you know, this area in your lumbars are out. This goes to your reproductive organs. She says, it's funny, I've been trying to get pregnant four and a half years. We're looking at adoption because the MDs say that we can't even get pregnant in vitro. He says, well, I've had some pretty good luck. So about six weeks later, she's coming down with the flu. She's nauseous. She suddenly realizes she hadn't had her period. She digs out the pregnancy test she had thrown away in the garbage in disgust, and she's pregnant. Who's the first person she calls? Her friend, who's the editor of the newspaper. It's a trick question. Anyway, when the baby's born, he sends a reporter and a photographer. And this is the result. This is Section D of the Monterey County Herald. Dr. Mark Kimes is the chiropractor. He sent me this. The whole front page, Section D. So I called Mark. Yeah, it's always oh, wonderful. So I called Mark up. Mark, how's your practice? No lie. Ted, I have a three-month waiting list. I cannot see a single new patient for three months. Everyone wants to get pregnant. <laughs> Turns out about a quarter to a fifth of all married couples have fertility problems. So I recommend when you get the lecture notes, make about 5,000 copies of this page, rent a helicopter and fly over a fertility <laughs> clinic in your area. Stamp your name and phone number on the back so the police will know who to arrest. You know? <laughs> Give this information out. Make copies. Put it on the bulletin board in your office. And, you know, oh, my God, I have a friend that can't get pregnant. Think I should bring her in? How are they going to know otherwise? So do it. Chiropractic and PMS. 11 PMS sufferers under chiropractic were evaluated for irritability and mood swings, tension, mental, cognitive functioning, eating habits, sexual drive, overall physical symptoms, and social improvement. All categories improve with the greatest improvement in sexual drive, social impairment, and mood swings. This chiropractor, James Browning, he calls the subluxation the mechanically induced pelvic pain and organic dysfunction syndrome. It's a little fancy term he likes to use. He has written many studies. This is just one. 29-year-old woman with pelvic, low back, and inguinal pain, incontinence, loss of genital sensitivity, loss of libido, and vaginal discharge. MDs found nothing wrong with her. Chiropractor found sacral nerve root problem. 
And after four weeks' care, all problems resolved. This is an interesting case, remission of hepatocellular carcinoma, liver cancer. And a 60-year-old male patient with liver cancer, his two older brothers died of liver cancer, the same cancer at 50 and 52. Under chiropractic, remission followed. A follow-up CAT scan revealed no lesions. Cancer disappeared. The patient would sleep one hour after adjustment in the doctor's office, another three at home. I have a friend. She was dying of cancer. She got under chiropractic care. She'd get an adjustment. She'd go home. She'd sleep 20 hours. That was 20 years ago. She is now a chiropractor in private practice. So, this is nothing new. This is nothing new. 1938, chiropractic news. Sylvia Ashworth. She was married to Carl Cleveland I. She had an interesting hobby. See those jars there? They're filled with tumors. These are tumors. She had over 100 jars in her collection. Tumors that patients vomited or coughed up or excreted or sloughed off under her care. She said the number one cause of tumors, carcinomas and all, was lack of proper nerve supply. But she said very important, when you adjust a patient, especially carcinoma, patient management is vital because the cancer starts to die and the toxemia can cause coma and death in the patient. In fact, the number one cause of death today from cancer is really from chemotherapy. The chemo kills the cancer, and the dead cancer poisons the patients, and they die from chemo. It's called toxic death, and this is in the journals. So what she always recommends, and I recommend, if you have cancer patients, make sure they start getting colonics, get them on a cleansing diet. You've got to manage them properly. When the cancer dies, they will die too unless they are properly cleansed especially if you know anyone on chemo, which is a horrible thing to put people on. And we have a great book, Questioning Chemotherapy, which I recommend this issue ever came up. Sylvia Ashworth, as a young girl, had cancer and was told to put her affairs in order. She had three months to live. So that's why she was so passionate about this issue. She lived quite longer under chiropractic care. Das Adlige Blockendrung Syndrome des Songslings und des Kleinkindes. I think that sums it up pretty good. <laughs> this is from a German medical journal. And the translation, blocked atlantal nerve syndrome in babies and infants. This is a German surgeon. Discovered the subluxation of the atlas. Blocked atlantal nerve syndrome. This is what he says. Blocked nerve impulses at the atlas in babies and infants cause lowered resistance to infections, especially ear, nose, and throat infections. Chiropractic can often bring about amazingly successful results. He also talks about improvement in brain function from atlas adjustments. And another German surgeon, kinematic imbalances due to suboccipital strain in newborns. He renamed the subluxation. He rediscovered it, suboccipital strain. Symptoms include torticollis, fever of unknown origin, loss of appetite, CNS disorders, facial swelling, asymmetric development of the skull and hips. Quote, removal of suboccipital strain is the fastest and most effective way to treat the symptoms. One session is sufficient in most cases. Dr. Biederman. Chiropractic and asthma, as we know, chiropractic has incredible results with asthmatic patients. Now, because we have cool things like MRIs and CAT scans, we can actually see a herniated disc disappear under chiropractic care, get drawn right back in, the herniation. And this is one, reduction of confirmed C5, C6 disc herniation, following specific adjustments. Very important. As I said, with my technique, you can adjust the discs directly. But just structurally, a lot of times you'll get these results, and I'm sure you have. MRI revealed C5, C6 disc herniation. Under chiropractic, the patient was symptom-free. Follow-up MRI, no reduced herniation. This is acquired verbal aphasia in a 7-year-old female. In other words, she can't talk. She was babbling normally until she was about 18 months old. Then she stopped speaking. By the time she was seven years old, she had a vocabulary of three words. Three words. She was examined by a pediatrician who referred her to an audiologist, a psychologist, a speech-language pathologist. No cause could be identified. And after seven weeks of spinal and cranial care, she had a more than 60-word vocabulary. They couldn't figure out what the cause was. So the chiropractor says, she stopped speaking in 18 months. Parents say, yep. What happened in 18 months? MMR shot. Couldn't the pediatrician ask that question? They're in total denial when it comes to vaccination. One attorney 
who defends vaccine injured families, said the needle can be in the kid's arm and the kid can go into seizures and the MDs are more likely to blame the power lines across the street than the shot that they're being given. That's the denial they're in. So the kid was becoming autistic, which used to be 1 in 10,000. Now, about 1 in 86. That's how bad it is. It was unknown before vaccination. I was in Washington at a conference, and I met Dr. Hugh Feudenberg, who's the world's 13th most quoted biologist in the world today. This guy is brilliant. He's an immunogeneticist. His textbooks are used in medical schools around the world. You know, some people become experts. They have 20 or 30 or 40 papers published by the top journals. Feudenberg has over 850 papers published in the top medical journals around the world. He talked about autism. This is what he said. 70% of autism is due to the measles virus vaccine. We can prove this is vaccine-related because the onset happens within a week of receiving the vaccine. So after the conference, I went up to him. I said, what's the other 30%? He said, that's the DPT shot. (laughs) Although I have heard reports of autism beginning after the hepatitis B shot as well. Chiropractic care and behavior in autistic kids. I helped fund this study. It was a very nicely done study. All 26 autistic children were under chiropractic care for nine months. They were able to stop all medication, like Ritalin and Dexedrin, showed improved bladder control, improved digestion, started speaking or speech improved, decreased ear infections, chronic cold stopped or decreased, improved sleep, improved eye, vision, and improved behavior. Five enrolled the first time in full-time classroom settings. Autism. Thank you. Look at this. This is wild. Five-year-old female. Picture this girl. She is diagnosed with autism. She has asthma and allergies and eczema and irritable bowel syndrome and left side of strabismus. On top of that, she has 25 violent temper tantrums a day. Ear-piercing screams. Bites her arm. Slap and banging her head. Hits people. This walks into your office. What do you think would be the outcome? This is Dr. Amalu in California. After one month chiropractic, all temper episodes, hyperactivity, violent behavior ceased. Eczema cleared. Strabismus and allergies stopped. Sleeping through the night, irritable bowel syndrome and asthma resolved. She was reevaluated and declared not autistic. How many autistic, how many sick kids do we pass on the way to work to take care of a low back pain patient? We have to get this out because we're more than back aches. This kid's life has been changed forever. It's because of some adjusting. Chiropractic in an infant with breastfeeding difficulties. 15-day-old baby, continuous crying with high-pitched screams. High-pitched screams are known as the creencephalic, encephalitic cry, which is due to vaccine injury. Full body shaking. Distended abdomen, excessive bowel gas. After adjustment at C1, significant reduction of crying, screaming, and shaking. After next hepatitis B vaccination, all symptoms returned to a severe degree. The chiropractor didn't say, don't vaccinate that kid. This is a vaccine reaction. If you vaccinate again, it's called a re-challenge. The kid may never come back after that. The chiropractor didn't know. That's why it's so important to know this. Ah, you got flu shots? Everybody have Costco around here? From Hugh Feudenberg. The chances of getting Alzheimer's disease is 10 times higher if an individual has had five consecutive flu shots. And is that the reason why Alzheimer's is to quadruple? So I asked Dr. Feudenberg, what's in the flu shots that causes Alzheimer's? He says, well, it's the mercury and the aluminum. It goes to the brain. Guess what? Flu zone is a new flu vaccine for babies. It has 25 micromilligrams of mercury in it. It also has chicken embryos, formaldehyde, which causes brain cancer, sucrose, sodium phosphate, gelatin, and polyethylene glycol, which is antifreeze. Very good. This is what they want to give to kids. So I highly recommend you tell the patient about Alzheimer's if they ask on the flu shot. If they decide to take the flu shot anyway, It's okay, because in a few years, they probably won't remember the conversation. (laughs) Little New York humor there. 
this is cool, that Alzheimer's. I found this in the journal Neurology. There is a strong correlation between head injuries as a young adult and the development of Alzheimer's. The time between the injury and the disease was about 50 years. Kid gets hit in the head with a soccer ball or falls. That adjustment that you give him now could be preventing Alzheimer's a half a century later. And I started looking up this stuff, head injury and Alzheimer's. It's all over the medical journals. Documented head injury in early adulthood and Alzheimer's. Both moderate and severe head injury as a young man is associated with increased risk of Alzheimer's and dementia in later life. There's more. Journal after journal. Head trauma and Alzheimer's. And the medical doctors and pharmaceutical companies swore there was no link between multiple sclerosis and vaccination, except if you go into the medical journals. From the Journal of Neurological Sciences, MS develops as a result of a viral infection or a vaccination. Now you know why there's so much MS today. Trauma, too, can cause it. This could have been written by a chiropractor. Listen, this is from the Journal of Clinical Neurology and Neurosurgery. Trauma to the head or neck or upper back impinging on the brain and spinal cord may affect blood-brain barrier permeability, leading to the formation of MS lesions or the enlargement and activation of old ones. These lesions might have resulted from many minor childhood head and neck injuries. This is like chiropractic 101. They're practically saying what causes MS. And here's another one we know. After four months chiropractic care, all MS symptoms disappeared. Follow-up MRI revealed no new lesions and reduction of the original ones. There's a lot of stuff. I just picked a few. The lecture notes have much more. And I put a lot of this stuff in the new brochures. Upper cervical management of Parkinson's disease. Of the 10 Parkinson's disease sufferers, nine reported trauma preceding the beginning of Parkinson's disease. Always ask about trauma, as I know you do. And when you have an MS or Parkinson's patient. Also ask about vaccination history. Eight improved under chiropractic. The two not helped were men over 65 with Parkinson's for eight years. Upper cervical chiropractic and fibromyalgia and chronic fatigue is one study. 23 men and women aged 11 to 76 with fibromyalgia and chronic fatigue for two to 35 years. Look at this. There was a 92 to 100% improvement in both conditions. All resumed normal activities, including full-time work, and maintained improvements at one-and-a-half-year follow-up. We just came out with a brochure on fibromyalgia, and this is in it. As is this, there's a 10 times increased risk of fibromyalgia within one year of a neck injury. This is from the journal Arthritis and Rheumatism. Visual recovery following chiropractic. This is cool. This is not a chiropractic journal. The Journal of Behavioral Optometry. It's about a 75-year-old man, goes to his optometrist, is blind after a car accident. The guy sends him to a chiropractor, and his vision comes back. This is from the Journal of Traditional Chinese Medicine. This is wild. I think this is so cool. After manipulation, vision was restored to no less than one in four cases with blindness. 25% of blind people, their vision came back after their necks were manipulated. Maybe it would be even 40% if they had specific adjustments. Who knows? But it's not even a chiropractic journal. A nine-year-old girl with bilateral concentric narrowing of the visual fields returned to normal immediately after adjustment. Why is this so important? Because there's no direct way of really easily measuring the amount of blood your brain gets. Your peripheral vision is a great way. And after accidents, they find people's peripheral vision drops, and when they get adjusted, it comes back, meaning more blood to the brain. So this is really cool. I think they're doing some work now with the blind spot. You know, we all have our little blind spot in our eyes that you can map that, that it improves after adjustments. I think Carrick is doing some work in that. It's neat stuff, neat studies. But concentric fields improve after adjustments. means more blood to the brain. It's a great little study. Chiropractic care for infants with dysfunctional nursing. I mean, there's so much great literature. I put it in all the brochures. I put it in the patient newsletter. Congenital torticollis. What's the medical treatment for it? Cut the SCM, surgery. Yeah. And this kid got adjusted, but it's bittersweet because I think one kid with this condition gets adjusted, maybe 50 or 100 with it, go under the knife. We have to get the message out. We have to educate. We've got to save these kids from this kind of stuff. Oh, this is a cool little study. A three-month-old girl moving her bowels once every seven to ten days with suppositories. She had a broken left clavicle from a birth trauma. 
They didn't know she had a broken left clavicle until months later in the hospital where they delivered the baby and broke her clavicle. They didn't tell the parents. They found out months later. By the third adjustment, she moved her bowels for the first time in her life without suppositories before leaving the office. <laughs> it was happy. By the fifth visit, bowel movements were one or more daily. So it's nice studies there. Oh, her eight-month hiccups turned to sighs of relief. This is like big deal hiccups, right? But this Bernie Firstman is a chiropractor, I think, in Long Island, New York. And he gets a patient in. She's been hiccuping for a long time, right? And he adjusts her, and her hiccups go away. She's thrilled. What does he do? Calls the newspaper. They're always looking for human interest stories. And they bring a photographer and a reporter, and they do a little workup. $50,000 free advertising, maybe? You get cool things happening in your office, make a phone call to the local paper. They're always looking for this cool stuff. And I know you've got great miracle stories all the time, right? A kid who goes from failing grades to A student after adjustments. Or, you know, kid can walk, gets out of his wheelchair or whatever. Or hiccuping, who would have thought? But you can get great stuff, great mileage from really the things that are happening every day in your practice. Athletic performance. If anyone's interested in becoming the team chiropractor for high school, college, minor league, major league, professional teams of all kinds, show them these papers. Chiropractic adjustments improved athletic performance and jumping and muscle strength, blood pressure, pulse rate, and treadmill stress testing, improvement in capillary counts, meaning more blood throughout the body. And this is a great study. The adjusted group had a 30% improvement in reaction time. The controls less than 1%. Now, you ever see the Olympics? What's the difference between gold and silver? Like 10 one hundredths of a second or something? I mean, 30% improvements could be the difference between a winning team and not. This is the kind of stuff we should be showing managers and trainers and all. We kind of let this information out. This is cool stuff. We were really doing great stuff. What do we do with this information? Tell everyone. That's all. Just let everyone know. Now, childhood vaccinations. When my son Seth was born, this issue hit home. Because although I wasn't going to vaccinate, in the back of my mind I had doubts. Am I really doing the right thing? Is it worth putting up with the school system? My mother-in-law? You know, the hassles? So I started researching the issue. I started going to conferences. I actually paid researchers to do research. And eventually this turned into this book, Vaccination Questions All Parents Should Ask. And Amazon picked it up. I'm very happy about it. And people would come to me because I made it part of my lectures when I do my 12-hour seminars. And they'd say, I'd like to give a seminar on vaccination. How should I do it? I'd say, well, just get the book. You know, it's inexpensive. Get the book. It's broken down. Questions and answers. It'd be easy to do a talk. Some did, but most did not. My wife says to me, you know, not everybody has the time and wherewithal to put together a whole vaccination lecture. I think it would be good to create. And I said, okay, and I put it in the back of my mind. And then Kevin Donka in Chicago says, let me tell you my story. I went to the local library. They have these free rooms, you know, community rooms. And I said, I'd like to give a talk on vaccination one night. So they picked a date, and the librarian put a sheet on the door. Dr. Kevin Donka will do a talk on the childhood vaccination controversy. And there are about 15 or 20 lines with the phone numbers to put. So Kevin comes back a few days before he's supposed to give the talk, and she gives him a stack of 30 sheets of paper. Well, they had to make lots of phone calls, because the room would only hold about 75 people. They broke it up into four talks. He said he got about 80 new families as patients. Not individual patients, 80 families. He said people were coming out of the woodwork. Everybody wanted to know about this. So that got me inspired to make a vaccination lecture kit, which was the biggest thing we ever did. It comes with CDs and lots of books. What are the CDs? You get three complete PowerPoint presentations, a half-hour one to give. You don't need PowerPoint, by the way, for it to run on your computer. If you have PowerPoint, you can play with it and make modifications so you have more flexibility, but you don't need it. A half hour, a one hour, and a two hour presentation, plus all the scripts, all the documentation, all the references, all the backup, and all the citations. You'll also get two CDs, my half hour talk and my one hour talk, how I give the talk. 
I don't want you to turn into a robot of what I say, but you'll hear, at least as a basis, how I say it. You'll get the full script also. And you'll get an audio-video CD, meaning you put it in the computer and it'll play. The slideshow will go and there'll be a voiceover. You don't even have to give the talk yourself. But if you save one kid from vaccine damage, get one family as a new patient. It's a no-brainer. Plus, you get lectures, pads, and a book, How to Give a Successful Talk. You get these pads. We sell them individually, and they're also posters. You know we have MDs ordering this from us now? I kid you not. I was funny. One day I get a call from my office. There's an MD who wants to order your stuff. They get nervous when MDs call. <laughs> I said, so? Have you ever heard of Christine Northrop, my office manager said? She's famous, right? She's ordering our literature on vaccination for her office. So this stuff is getting out there. It's not just us. It's them. They're getting into it. Tuesday, I got this email from Tim Johnson. I gave your vaccination talk Monday evening to 30 people. It was incredibly well received. I heard gasps from the crowd as I read the statistics. I scheduled five new patients, and a dad said he's bringing his whole family in for care. I emphasize the need for chiropractic and all children, especially those with developmental problems. I just did my first vaccine lecture. You've made it a no-brainer. The half-hour lecture turned into an hour. Everyone was asking questions. I have a lecture coming up for one hour. The room has been reserved for three if needed. Chad Rolfson. Louise Marcotte, very shy chiropractor in Canada. I never do talks. I gave the vaccine talk to a small group and got five families as new patients. This is amazing. There's such a hunger. I was even on the local news as they popped in on my lecture, Kimberly Taylor. I did my first lecture in the office and had a great turnout. Some had upcoming well baby visits. I only did a 30-minute lecture, and they wanted more. Pam Stone, vaccine lecture kit is full of great information, facts, booklets, pads, so much for us to take to the public. Everyone has to purchase this. Listen to her. Anyway, a lot of material. We need to let the people know. Will Treving. The hour presentation went extremely well at a church in New Haven. 130 people attended. It was the only time I have done a talk where there was absolutely no animosity from anyone. More than half spoke with me afterwards. So this is part of the talk. I don't have much time, but I'll give as much as I can. Questions all parents should ask. Parents want what's best for their children. For that reason, more parents are rejecting vaccinations for their children, and they do it for a number of reasons. They consider the vaccines more dangerous than the disease. They prefer natural rather than artificial immunity. They have a religious or a philosophical objection to vaccination. Or they have a vaccine-injured child, which is sadly a growing number, or a mixture of these reasons. The numbers are large. USA Today, October 2000, roughly one-fourth of American parents have serious concerns over the safety of vaccinations their children receive. Wall Street Journal, August 2003. There is growing opposition to the number of shots required. Years ago, they'd look at you like you were a kook, a crazy. Now, parents are really anti-vaccine, growing numbers, and they want good information. They're not getting it from their MDs. This is the recommended childhood vaccination schedule. By six months of age, an infant is to be injected with 45 vaccines. By six months. MMR is three, DPT is three, the Prevnar pneumococcal is eight, and on and on. At 18 months, they're to get 64, and at four to six years, at least 74. Is it any wonder why kids today have neurological and immune system and developmental problems and allergies and all these other problems? Chiropractors have always opposed mandatory vaccination. D.D. Palmer, compulsory vaccination is an outrage and a gross interference with a liberty and a land of freedom. But it's not just chiropractors. Individual MDs have also spoken out. Robert Mendelssohn, there is no convincing scientific evidence that mass inoculations can be credited with eliminating any childhood disease. I urge you to reject all inoculations for your child. Now, it's not just individual chiropractors and MDs. Now, medical organizations are standing up and saying this. The Association of American Physicians and Surgeons calls for an end to mandatory childhood vaccines. Our children face the possibility of death or long, serious long-term adverse effects from mandated vaccines that aren't necessary or have very limited benefits, says Jane Orient, MD. British Medical Association, quote, we do not believe that compulsory immunization is in any way appropriate. Why do I do this in the beginning of the talk? To show parents it's okay to think outside the box, outside the medical box that has brainwashed them into vaccinating, that MDs, medical organizations, you want to get them to loosen up their fear. 
This is very powerful. That's why I put it in. Everybody knows Raggedy Ann, a symbol of Americana. This is the real story of Raggedy Ann. In 1921, Johnny Gruel's eight-year-old daughter was vaccinated in school without her parents' permission. Between the months she became ill from the vaccination and her death, her body was completely limp like a rag doll. It was this sick vaccine-injured child that inspired Gruel to create Raggedy Ann. As one mother wrote, little did I know as I played with Raggedy Ann as a child that I was practicing for when I would get my very own real limp vaccine-injured baby. Now, the big question is, are vaccinated children healthier than non-vaccinated children? That's in the vaccine question book. Isn't that the basic question? I mean, don't people vaccinate their kids so they'll be healthier? So are vaccinated kids healthier than non-vaccinated kids? There is no proof vaccinated children are healthier. No major study has compared vaccinated and non-vaccinated children to see which is healthier. Look what Philip and K.O. M.D. writes. In my medical career, I've treated vaccinated and unvaccinated children, and the unvaccinated children are far healthier than the vaccinated ones. I've heard this from MDs over and over. It's the vaccinated children with immune system problems, with the neurological problems, with the ear infections, and with the autism and the cerebral palsy and the asthma, not the non-vaccinated kids. However, there are some studies which I dug up. They actually compared vaccinated to non-vaccinated kids. New Zealand. The immunized kids, 23% had asthma, 30% had other allergies. The non-immunized kids, zero had asthma or allergies. Journal of the AMA, in this study, 10% of kids immunized got asthma. There was one case of asthma out of 91 who had none, no immunizations. This is from the British journal Thorax, December 2002. DPPT, we've heard of DPT. DPPT, the extra P is polio. So it's DPT plus polio or MMR. Children vaccinated with DPPT or MMR, listen to this, 14 times more asthma and 9.4 times more eczema than non-vaccinated kids. Is there a difference between vaccinated and non-vaccinated kids? Do the benefits outweigh the risks? That's why people say you should vaccinate. They say, well, some kids may get hurt, but the benefits outweigh the risks. Is that true? No one knows. No one knows what the chances are your child may be hurt or killed by a vaccine. Why? Because in order to do a risk-benefit analysis, we need to know how many kids are being hurt. And the MDs and government officials are not reporting vaccine-injured kids. The FDA itself admitted that doctors underreport adverse vaccine reactions by 90%, meaning that for every 10 kids that are hurt, only one is ever reported. So they say, oh, the vaccines are safe. Well, yeah, if nobody ever reports it, but one in 10 is probably not the right figure. In an Institute of Medicine report in Washington, James Frohla from Conagut Laboratories, they did their own study. This is what they said. The company estimates about a 50-fold underreporting of adverse events in the passive reporting system. Of 50 kids hurt, only one is ever reported. What happens to the other 49? The parents are told it's a coincidence. Had nothing to do with the vaccine. It's something else. It must be something that you did. It's your genes. It's your genetic. They blame the parents, saying, you gave your kids bad genes. That's why your kid has this problem. Autism is genetic. You've heard it. I have other studies. What I've done here is just put a few together. This is not the whole lecture. I have one study showing only one in 500 kids is ever reported. This is an 18-month-old little girl. Approximately two weeks post-measles vaccination, patient experienced acute demyelinating encephalomyelitis, deteriorated rapidly, and died, deteriorated. The cause of death was encephalomyelitis. An autopsy was performed, but the brain was liquefied. They put on the death encephalomyelitis, not vaccination. They don't write that on the death certificate. So nobody knew. The parents forced them to write this. How many kids are hurt? According to Harris Coulter, in his book, Vaccination, Social Violence, and Criminality, which is the best vaccination book ever written, Between 15 and 20% of American school children are learning disabled with minimal brain dysfunction, ADD, ADHD, dyslexia, well, directly caused by vaccine damage. One in five or six, not one in a million, one in five or six. Are vaccines effective? What do you mean by effective? Well, we mean your kid doesn't get sick, but the government doesn't mean that. According to the CDC, effective means antibodies are produced. But you can have somebody with very high antibody levels, get sick. And somebody with very low antibody levels 
have high resistance to disease, there's often no correlation between antibodies and resistance to disease. But that's the standard the government uses when they say vaccines are effective. Now, here's to give an idea of how effective they are. Pertussis infections are common. In this population, they had an epidemic. 98% were vaccinated. Here's another one. U.S. government report. Outbreaks have occurred in 100% vaccinated populations. 80% of measles today is contracted in vaccinated people. This is another one. With mandatory vaccination and five doses of DPT, how well does it work? There is now more whooping cough for pertussis than before vaccination started. And here's another one. 137 kids got measles. 98.7 were vaccinated. You see this in the medical journals over and over. Vaccines interfere with transplacental immunity, meaning when you vaccinate a little girl, when she gets older, she doesn't have the immune factors to give to her unborn baby when she gets pregnant. And that's why whooping cough deaths are now in infants. That's why it's so important to breastfeed. It's so important to go the natural route to keep your child healthy. It's a lot of material. I don't really have time for all of it, but how long do they look to see if the vaccine is safe? This is from the product insert, four days. This is the research on the hepatitis B shot. They watched the kids for four days and then said the vaccines are safe. There's no long-term effects. <laughs> I know it's funny, but it's sad, too. Um, crib death. In 1975, Japan raised the minimum age of vaccination from two months to two years. Crib death disappeared along with infantile seizures, meningitis, and other infectious diseases. Japan went from 17th in infant mortality to 1, lowest infant mortality in the world. Robert Mendelssohn, pediatricians continue to defend vaccination to the death. The question parents should be asking is, who's death? So there's a whole lot of other material, a lot of graphs and charts. And I like this one, are there benefits to acute illnesses, which really gets into the chiropractic thing of letting disease express itself. When we permit our kids to be healthy and manage them properly, they are stronger, healthier adults. Autism can be reversed. I have information on it, get exemptions. And this is my quote from Marcel Proust, which is really a chiropractic message. I end it with this. Even the wisest of doctors are relying on scientific truths, the errors of which will be recognized within a few years' time. Vaccinations will go the way of bloodletting. And it's up to us to stand up and give people the information for our children and our families and for our patients' children. So thank you and thank the masters very much for letting me come. Thank you. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Master Circle podcast. Many of our podcast listeners ask about the source of these shows. Well, they come from seminars, teleclasses, interviews, and audio albums, many of which are available for purchase at the Master Circle Marketplace. Just go to www.themastercircle.net and look through our vast library of useful, practical, and inspiring audio materials. And if you'd like to attend one of our live seminars, just call us at 800-451-4514, and we'll be happy to register you. It's a pleasure to serve you and keep growing yourself and growing your practice.